This is your coffee break. Hi friends, I'm back again this week and I have with me a special treat for you. I have today Robert Tannenbaum, who is a New York Times bestselling author of many, many, many books, um, all part of the same series. And so today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the 28th installment in this series, as well as a couple other things. Robert, welcome to the show. Sarah, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted. <laughs> oh, well, I'm delighted to have you. I hear you are in beautiful Southern California. I'm very jealous. Usually when I start the show, I love to talk about where writers come from, how they became writers. You have this amazing, amazing history of working within the legal system and teaching and doing all sorts of incredible things with your life. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. I grew up in Brooklyn, and um, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of different uh, opportunities to go to college and went on a basketball scholarship to the University of California at Berkeley and had a, just a tremendous experience there. It was uh, during the pre, what I call pre-revolutionary Berkeley, revolutionary Berkeley, <laughs> post-revolutionary Berkeley. And it was, a, it was a tremendous time. I stayed there for law school, and then after law school, I went back home to New York to work in the district attorney's office in Manhattan, which is New York County, um, legendary district attorney Frank Hogan. Mm. Uh, and that was uh, that experience far exceeded what my dream was, which was to work there. And eventually I worked my way uh, up into what we call the higher bureaus and then was selected to go to the Homicide Bureau. Mm. And my bureau chief there was John Keenan, who's now Federal District Court Judge John Keenan in the Southern District of Manhattan. And Mel Glass, who became a, a, a Supreme Court judge, was my mentor in the earlier years when I was learning the ABCs of being an assistant district attorney. So during the course of uh, having those two mentors, they were probably, along with District Attorney Hogan, the finest people ever served in that office. And as a matter of fact, they asked me to write a, a book about one of their cases, which was and is probably the most important case ever to come out of New York. It's called the Wiley Hoffett case. Hmm. And it was people v. Richard Robles. It was a brutal double rape murder in their apartment back on August 28, 1963, the same day Martin Luther King Cohen and so on, he was in Washington giving his I Have a Dream speech. It was 10.30 in the morning on that August day, and on the third floor, the defendant was able to get in, slaughtered them brutally, annihilated them. And eight months later in Brooklyn, which is Kings County, of course, New York City and the five boroughs are made up of five different counties. Totally different, of course, from take L.A. County, which is made up of 87 cities and unincorporated villages. And there's one district attorney with multiple police forces, sheriff's departments, and so on. But New York, of course, is unique for many reasons. And Manhattan is New York County. We have one police force. But uh, in Brooklyn, it's Kings County with a separate DA. And each borough has its own DA. Mm -hmm. So a young man ultimately winds up confessing to the to the brutal murders eight months later, and my mentors ultimately realize that he's innocent, and they exonerate the unjustly accused and find the real killer. It's one of the most dramatic, important cases because it was cited by Chief Justice Earl Warren when he wrote the Miranda opinion. Oh, my gosh. So it, they altered police procedures applying due process standards of fairness, which are very much a part of the world today, as everybody knows particularly everybody who watches any of the genre on television. You hear, well, you know, they hear the, the, the screenwriters talk about getting lawyered up and Mirandized and so on. It was all because, in large measure, about this particular case. And the book I wrote, uh, Echoes of My Soul, is, of course, nonfiction. I started with nonfiction. And the reason I started with nonfiction is, and you're right, the Infamy, which is my new book, which came out in September, of, I say last year, I don't know where 2016 went, but it was 2016, flew by. That is my 28th novel, Infamy. Um, but my first two books were nonfiction. And then three years ago or so, I did Echoes of My Soul, which is a nonfiction book I just mentioned. And the first book I did was um, Badge of the Assassin, which was about assassins who came to New York to solely execute police having no interfacing, no escalation of, of any kind of conduct, but just because they were blue. Oh they were, were assassinated. And these, this group 
had been doing it around the country, and the only convictions were, in my case, in Manhattan. And I wanted to write about that, so I had the opportunity to do it, and I was very fortunate and lucky to get published. And it was it was Dutton and the the um, person who was the then in charge, the publisher and my editor, happened to have been a juror of mine five years earlier. <laughs> really? Yeah, in a very sensational case. And of course, I never knew him before. I never spoke to him after the trial. It was a five-month prosecution where I was trying to kill us in a very brutal case. And when I decided five years later after the trial that resulted from the assassination of the two New York City police officers where the three killers were convicted after five months and, and, and a hung jury in between. So I was in court basically for 10 months on that case and uh, trying it. The, I, I really wanted to write about what's involved. Some of the mistakes I made during preparation at the fundamentals you always go back to, no matter how good you may think you are, you get a kick, you get a kick in the rear and you realize that you really have to prepare and do everything by the book as you were taught. And no matter how good you may think you are, it's always a good lesson in life to know that you go back to those basics and preparation, preparation, preparation. So I wanted to talk about all those kinds of issues, particularly what's involved in these major high-profile cases from the prosecution point of view. Mm. The witnesses who were scared to death, the jurors who were confronted with demonstrators in the courtroom, outside in the courthouse, and so on. So I um, remembered that I had a juror five years earlier whose uh, first name I remembered it was Henry, and I knew he was a Farrar Strauss, the publisher. So I called up Farrar Strauss, and I said, could you please let me speak to Henry, the editor? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. The uh, young uh, woman uh, thought I was kidding, you know, like Sam made the pants too long kind of thing. <laughs> I, so I said, look, I know this sounds funny, but if you tell me every editor you have whose first name is Henry, give me his last name. I know when I hear it, I will know who it is. <laughs> and she said, you mean Henry Robbins? I said, that's it. May I please speak to him? She said, no. I said, why not? She said, he's not here anymore. Where is he? Well, he's the editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster. So I oh. called the better trail as Simon and Schuster, and I asked for Henry Robbins, and they said he's not here, and they told me that he's at Dutton. I called up Dutton. <laughs> Lo and behold, Henry gets on the phone. I said, Henry, you don't remember me. Oh, I remember. Believe me, I remember. <laughs> Five months trial, I remember. Henry, if I knew you couldn't hold the job, I never would have put you on the jury. What's your story here? And, of course, he told me he... he uh, went to Dutton because he had his own imprint. And he, and he was, you know, this is sort of a meant-to-be story in that, unbeknownst to me, he was the number one person in the city in the publishing industry. And, and his authors were John Gregory Dunn, John Irving. He did, in, oh my in, gosh. 19, in 1977, he did True Confessions uh, with John Gregory Dunn. In 1978, he did The World According to Garp with John Irving. And in 1979, his featured book was Badger the Assassin, my book, which was nonfiction. He, did, he, did, he, he just did novels. So as I say, you know, Joan Didion was one of his authors, Irma Bombach, Thomas Wolfe. Uh, he was just one of the most prolific, dear, kind, incredibly brilliant and, um, mentor who never thought about himself and wanted to see the people he was writing, uh, who were writing books for him to succeed. It was just a blessing. Oh, and my gosh, yeah. So he, um, he was responsible, as a matter of fact, for naming the only one of my books. I have 31 books now published, and number 32 will be coming out next uh, September this year. But um, also a novel, by the way, with the same continuing characters, the district attorney now in New York County, his wife Marlene, and their three children. Henry Robbins named the piano teacher, which is about a psychosexual killer in Manhattan, uh, who had an irresistible impulse to attack women and uh, engage in sexual misconduct uh, and, and, and murder. So Henry named that book The Piano Teacher, and uh, he was just, that experience in and of itself was absolutely incredible. His picture stands proudly in my office, believe me. Oh. I've been blessed in my life, I must tell you, Sarah. I had um, great parents and having worked for District Attorney Frank Hogan, who was greater than his legend. Hmm. He was absolutely the kind of person who just dealt 
with qualitative issues caring nothing about politics. And he served for approximately 34 years in that office, where he was a lifelong registered Democrat, but always had Republican, liberal, and conservative party support. And, um, and of course, I had uh, John Keener and Mel Glass as my mentors. And so any success I had, I have to tell you that I stood on the shoulders of great people, believe me. So I then worked with Henry on Badger the Assassin, and then, um, which became a movie. Jimmy Woods played me, Yafit Koto played my very dear friend, the detective Cliff Fenton, and that was a separate wonderful experience. And, and then I was, I've been writing, I then started to do novels after The Piano Teacher, so Badger the Assassin was my first book, nonfiction, about the police killers, uh, those who were assassinating police, and then The Piano Teacher about the psychosexual killer, and then I started to do the novels. And the biggest reason was that I didn't want to write anything that was going to embarrass people I had to work with. And uh, so I decided I'd novelize it. And most of the novels really are met tangentially and in part with my own life experiences in the DA's office. I ultimately was the bureau chief of the criminal courts around the Homicide Bureau. And the amount of crime every day in Manhattan then was... We had 250 new cases every day. Oh, my god! 150 cases from 9 in the morning until 5 at night. And then night court, another 100 cases were processed from approximately 7 at night to about 1, 2 in the morning, and uh, seven days a week. So it was a tremendous experience. As I said, this is something I always wanted to do growing up in Brooklyn. Frank Hogan, district attorney, was a legend. And then I, that's what I wanted to do. And thank God I had a chance to do it. I, I never thought about the degree of difficulty of having to get there yeah. because there are about 800 applications. He took 17 in my class graduating from law school. So um, it just was, was a fabulous experience and time, and it's just been a blessing. So I, it, my books really are about the values that we care about, the murder cases that we, in, during the course of um, the book, are investigated. Then there's, tr there's the trial aspect of it all. I have tried about 200 cases to verdict as a prosecutor. So I'm able to discuss a lot of the issues that are popping up all the time. It's somewhat frustrating listening to alleged talking head experts who know as much about some of this stuff as you can put on the head of a pin, <laughs> but never does it stop them from pontificating and getting airtime. Nevertheless, to have the chance to do these books now, and I've been with Simon & Schuster for the last 17, 18 years, uh, and they've been great. So that's really the background for it. You know, there, were, there aren't blank pages here. It's like, I know the beginning, middle, and end of every story. So off we go, you know, into discussing through the characterizations things that I really care about, and that's the values of who we are as Americans. I'm often reminded, you know, we have these discussions about values, about JFK's inaugural. He said, we are heirs to the great revolution. And we should be proud of our ancient heritage. I have to tell you, I met JFK when he came to Berkeley in 1962. He came on Charter Day. It was the first time he went to a public university. I was in Naval ROTC. Those days, you had to be a member of ROTC. Uh, normally, you go Army, but you volunteer to go Navy. I went Navy. And um, I also had an appointment to the Naval Academy, which I didn't take out of high school. When I saw Berkeley, I know that was the place for me. <laughs> and... Uh, it was like summer camp for seven years. You come from New York to go to Berkeley, believe me. You never get any sweatpants and T-shirt and sneakers. <laughs> I say to my friends, where do you guys ever go on vacation? How do you leave this place? It's unbelievable. Oh, I bet. So uh, I met uh, JFK, and uh, he spoke in Memorial Stadium. During football games, that seat's 60,000. But with all the chairs that were placed on the field in the makeshift uh, dais that was put up, uh, there were about 100,000 people on the field. And uh, I was in the honor guard, and I, it was just an incredible moment to meet him, uh, as I did Martin Luther King, who came and spoke at Sproul Hall uh, many years later. And then, you know, as fate would have it, I don't know how this ever happened. I was then asked to go to Washington after uh, Frank Hogan died. The office became politicized. There was no place for me to be there when that happened. Uh, there's no Republican or Democrat way to gather evidence and God knows there's no liberal or conservative way to evaluate it. Yeah. But you have to have an apolitical district attorney in order to do justice. And of course, that's what Echoes of My Soul is all about. Here is the, in the major case, 
in New York City, two women in their apartment in a fashionable Upper East Side of Manhattan with a doorman on the third floor. And this killer gets into that apartment because the window was open, which was right near the service stairway window, the oh window in the kitchen. And he was able to bounce in from the service stairway window into the open window, not knowing what he would find. And he then murdered and, and just annihilated Janice Wiley and Emily Hoffa, two young women in their early 20s. So the wrong man was then indicted. And District Attorney Hogan not only admitted when he realized they had the wrong person, he exonerated him and then went out and found the real killer. And that's the way I expect, and I'm sure you expect, and people who have values expect, the, the way the government should work. You mm -hmm. make a mistake, you admit it. You don't hide it. Mm -hmm. You don't double talk it or spin it, as they say today. You admit it and correct it and, tr and make sure, you know, as best you can, it never happens again. So, and of course, in the justice system, one of the things that's most important is, it's probably the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. You must exonerate the unjustly accused as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Because as Americans, we care most about freedom. That's who we are. We're free people. And to have the government falsely in prison, incarcerate for any period of time, anyone who is not guilty is, is a destructive force. It does violence to our system of justice. And of course, the other aspect of it is, when you're dealing with the hardcore criminals, you don't get involved in plea bargaining. You indict, you're ready to try the case. And that's the way the system should work. You can't try every case, obviously, but you have to prioritize. And you have to have qualitative disposition in these cases. And it doesn't matter what the politics are. It doesn't matter who the media thinks is right or wrong. The only thing that matters is what the evidence is and the nature of the crime and the criminal record of that, the accused. That's the evaluation process on dispositions. But some cases have to be marked no less a plea, which coincidentally is the title of my first novel. <laughs> I like this. I like where this is going. Yeah, that was a quick little segue right uh -huh. there. I want, to, I want to, you know, full disclosure with me, so I don't uh, have someone tell you, you know, he said, no less a plea. Well, I was pushing one of his books. Of course I am. Absolutely I am. <laughs> it's a wonderful novel, and I think you get a kick out of it if you take a look at it. But uh, that's, to me, what this is all about. It's just a chance to really talk about the issues I care about because we have to uplift the system of our government. Lying is not sufficient. That is not, it's not tolerable. There's a moral component to everything we do, particularly when you're in the government. But people are getting the notion more and more that everybody who's a politician lies. In other words, we've got to pick the best liar or the worst liar. I'm not quite sure how to evaluate that. <laughs> or do we teach our children to lie so they'll succeed? Maybe, you know, they'll, they'll attain a high position in the government. I, I, I say not, of course, and, and that's a facetious comment. The point is, you tell the truth, whatever it may be, and in the truth-finding process, because trials really and, and investigations on the criminal side, and for that matter, anywhere, are sacred solemn searches for truth. If something is asserted, you want to make sure that you have the evidence to back it up. And I mean evidence beyond any and all doubt, not just beyond the reasonable doubt. You try these brutal, vicious, all kinds of cases, but the brutal, vicious high-profile murder cases that I prosecuted, juries are not going to do mental gymnastics saying, well, I have a doubt, but is it reasonable? Mm. You better prove that case beyond any and all doubt and explain why it is such, based upon the evidence in the case and what the corroboration is and how witnesses came forward, separate apart, and how everything dovetail. And it's one large mosaic. Each tile is a piece of evidence. When you finish that tile, all the tiles in that mosaic are the face of the defendant. And that's the process that one should go on, be involved in, when you're, particularly when you're a prosecutor. And you don't want to be just a... Too, too often we see prosecutors using the office as a political stepping stone. And it's, it's never-ending. They go from DA to attorney general of the state, perhaps, to governor, to president, to emperor. God knows where it ends. <laughs> that's why this has been a blessing for me to be able to have my, my, the, the ability to get published all my thoughts and things I really care about. Oh my gosh, definitely. I'm hearing such strong themes come through. You've talked about these values. You've talked about justice. I even have a quote here from Absolute Rage that, that talks about language being sacred. And I really feel that coming through when you talk. I think that's just, that's so wonderful. Did you start off with these strong feelings or did they kind of progress as you wrote more and more books on the subject? Well, my feelings, you know, when I went to Berkeley, let's start right there. I, and even before that in high school, they were swirling around in Brooklyn when I was growing up, where the Rosenberg trial, 
the Rosenbergs, um, Ethel Rosenberg and, um, and, and her husband um, for espionage with respect to the Russians and the, and the atomic bomb. And there are a lot of different kinds of things that were being discussed in the household that were, of, that were significant issues. So early on, I was involved in, in discussing things that I really cared about. And I was also on the debating team when I was at Berkeley. The arguments and debates we had amongst ourselves on the debating team far exceeded any school we ever went to, I'll tell you that. <laughs> there were a lot of different divergent views about a lot of different things, but as you can well imagine. But I've always been uh, very much a very strict constitutional constructionist in that regard. And this is not a living document to me to the extent that you could say... Well, you know, this is how they're doing it in France now. Should we take that into consideration? The founders were such blessed souls. And we, we, we're living with that right now, aren't we? Mm -hmm. The whole nature of the Electoral College, the nature of federalism, federal government, state government, the separation of powers, and the respect you have to have for that, for all of it. When you think John Adams was the first president, the second president, of course, after Washington, but the first president to sit in that Oval Office. You have to have a sense of respect for American history and recognizing where reform is necessary, but sitting back and understanding the brilliance of the founders. After all, I mean, they, they, most of them were very familiar with the prehistory of what was going on and going back to the Greeks and the Romans. The whole Sixth Amendment, for example, is based really in part on the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh, hmm. 17th century, in like 1603. Uh, he was charged with infamous acts, and he was, the, he was very close um, to Queen Elizabeth. And when she died, people at court who were jealous of him charged him with crimes he didn't commit. And by that, I mean to say he was charged with a letter that was written by an alleged co-conspirator whose name was Cobham, for example. And Sir Walter Raleigh said, I can't cross-examine a letter. Bring in Cobham. <laughs> Cobham will tell you he, he didn't mean any of this. And ultimately, Cobham uh, recanted and rescinded that letter. But he, Raleigh was convicted. And he was never able to confront his accusers. The Sixth Amendment mm -hmm. to the United States Constitution is a brilliant piece of criminal procedure. And we have uh, in that, not, uh, not only do we have the right to counsel, but we have the, what we call the confrontation clause, that anybody who accuses another individual that results in any kind of crime charge, the person charged has the absolute right to confront his accusers. And that's because of the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh in the main. I mean, there were other issues that led to that, of course, but that was a pivotal one. But when you, know, you think about it, look, they had no Monday night football. They, you know, <laughs> different world we're talking about. This was a world of scholarship, of... Uh, of solitude, of, of genius. So I always felt that, yes, reform is critical, but the rule of law is what matters most. And within the rule of law in our country, we're capable of doing anything right. And, and, and that's what it requires. It's got a lot of restraint you need when you're in public office. And when I think of cases like, for example, the um, Duke Lacrosse case, for example, where three young men are charged who are innocent and their lives are wrecked, just based upon the charge of an alleged rape of a young woman on campus. And it turned out that she made up the story. But before that happened, the faculty at Duke, the administration at Duke, all condemned the accused, knowing none of the facts, not caring about it. It's almost Alice in Wonderland-esque. Yeah. First the sentence, then the trial. But what if the defendant should be found not guilty? And the queen responds, all the better. That's basically what happens when you have DAs who are using the system to enhance pathetically their own career. And if it weren't for the fact that these young men at Duke had parents of means, it's been estimated that the parents of the accused in that case, prior to exoneration, were spending approximately $100,000 a month. Oh, my gosh. If, had they not been of means, their, their children would have been convicted and in prison and their lives wrecked. And as the case unfolded, ultimately the accuser re recanted, rescinded her comments. District attorney was a fraud. He was disbarred. Oh, my and, gosh. And the Duke faculty to this day has never apologized. 
Really? So, yeah, it's really it, it's the kind of situations where you get the mass hysteria, the media picks it up and chooses sides, and innocent people get hurt. The system, it does violence to our system, and this system is you you it's geared towards deciding cases without fear or favor to either side. I can't tell you the book I'm working on right now is entitled Without Fear or Favor, and Ooh. it'll be out next. It'll be out in September this year. But if you, if one has a strong value system about things that really matter, uh, which encompasses basically everything in your life, then you would enjoy reading my books, that I'll tell you. <laughs> because they're value-oriented. Yes, Yes. the, the bad guys are different. Uh, in, the, in the series, um, uh, Roger Butch Carp is now the district attorney of New York County. His wife, Marlene Champy, was an assistant district attorney in charge of the sex crimes unit. She left, take, protects women from those who inflict harm upon them, and um, they have three uh, children. Uh, the oldest is a daughter and two sons, twins. So those are our crime, that's our crime-fighting family, and we also have um, the chief of the district attorney's uh, detective squad, Clay Fulton, who is the personage of a very, very close friend of mine who is the top detective in New York. So... In large measure, a lot of this is reflective of my own experiences. So that's why I say, when you, this is like a meant-to-be kind of uh, story unto itself. I'm so curious. You mentioned the, the crime-fighting family in your books, and I have so many questions about writing such a long series. Um, when you started out with that first book, and you start off with your characters, uh, Butch and Marlene, did you know that it was going to be such a long series? Did you know where their character arcs would take them? Did you have any idea of what that would be? When I, the first book I did, Badger the Assassin, I thought that was the only book I would ever do. I never thought beyond it. Henry Robinson sat me down and asked me to tell him some stories about some other cases. And then I, we decided we would do together um, the piano teacher, the psychosexual killer who has this irresistible impulse to attack women, he's sexually impotent, uh, kills them, and then performs a sex act on them in death. He was convicted of a, of a murder. He, gets, he got out because he was a, a piano teacher to the warden's children, and he served five years on a brutal, vicious murder. Was the warden said he was a model prisoner, and he got out, and no sooner does he get out, a few months later he winds up killing another young woman. And then the warden was quoted as saying, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of this, gee whiz. I guess the psychosexual killer should be treated somewhat differently from the average killer. <laughs> oh, it took him 30 some odd years in, uh, in leading his way up to be a warden in public safety <laughs> to figure that out. So in any event, Ben Henry and I talked about, while I was doing The Piano Teacher, we talked about novelizing it because I was, I, I, as I said, I, there's no way friend or foes, I didn't want to in any way have a vehicle that would embarrass or in any way insult any of the people I had ever come in contact with. And that's when we decided I would novelize these stories. But I didn't know, I, I had no idea uh, how it would take off. That is how it would be accepted by the public and by the publishing world. So thank God it happened. <laughs> and here I am 31 books later. So it's, it's just been a fabulous experience. And each book, you know, you. I have great, great editors, um, copy editors as well, are mm. sensational. And we sort of have a contest. When I submit the manuscript, I think it's perfect. <laughs> yes. I haven't won that contest. <laughs> <laughs> and they come back with brilliant commentary, I have to tell you. Oh, yeah. Absolutely sensational. So, as you know, as I said, time and time again, it's just been from going from a prosecutor in the famous office of the legendary district attorney, Frank Hogan, then to Washington, uh, where I was asked to be deputy chief counsel to the committee, invest the assassinations committee, investigating the assassinations of President Kennedy and Martin Luther King, two people I had met at Berkeley, who we are, I'm in Washington, and involved in those investigations. There was a congressional committee, a select committee, and uh, that was another incredible experience. But um, then I had the opportunity to work with Richard Sprague, who was the main lawyer in Philadelphia, if not the state of Pennsylvania, if not the whole country. One of the few people who's tried more cases than I. He was a brilliant lawyer, is a brilliant lawyer, 
and he's still trying cases in Philadelphia now. <laughs> and uh, a dear friend, and we had a firm together in Philly after the experience in Washington. But I was going around the country actually trying cases. I was never home. I didn't want to leave my family for my career. So we packed up, left Philly, and came out here to Southern California. So that's the story in a nutshell. So were you writing fiction while you were also um, sort of practicing? Was that, uh, did you have to balance those things at all? No, because uh, I didn't start really until I had left the DA's office and I was really by myself in private practice. After Sprague and I left the firm, I left the firm. Um, it was Sprague and Tannenbaum. And I, when I left, and I am still very close with Richard Sprague to this day, we'll be going back and visiting him next month. But I cut down the amount of trials I had because I didn't want to keep now living in Southern California. I didn't want to be away from my family for the length of time that's necessary in some of these cases, some of which was the lightest load was about 10-week to 12-week trials. So I really wanted to cut that down, which I did. So that's what happened. Then I was teaching up at Berkeley in law school, of course, in advanced criminal procedure, which I enjoyed. A lot of my professors uh, were involved in still teaching. And so that was, that was quite a, an experience. And uh, the books became a very, very um, vital aspect of what my interest was at that stage after all these other experiences, was to talk about the values and values and values and the kinds of things that you know, we, we really care about, it seems to me. So with that, I mean, what is your favorite part of the writing process? Is it having a, a sort of venue for values to come across, or, or what's your favorite part about writing fiction? Well, you create your own universe, number one. Doing nonfiction, there's an exactitude with respect to definitive facts. Doing the novels, about my own, a lot of which are about my own investigations and thoughts about many different things that matter to me, you're creating, again, your own environment and you have your own storytelling. So the, char- the integrity of the characters uh, is reflective of the in- my views about the integrity of the system, on how the system can only work if you have high-integrity people who are in it who are selfless. So the stories that I'm telling are stories that deal with the kinds of values that, uh, that matter a lot. It matter to me, and, I, and it seems to hope, thankfully, it matters to a sufficient number of people who are <laughs> buying the books. And so that, that's the fun part is... What is the story I want to tell that will highlight the kinds of things that we care about? You know, and there's a whole panoply of different kinds of things that we talk about in the justice system. And that's how I really focus on my work. And right now, you know, we have this whole negative view of police. Mm -hmm. We have some cases that are outrageous, some cases that are misrepresented, particularly by the media and other people who seek to use the system to destroy it. And yet there needs to be serious reform as well in certain precincts, which requires people like legendary D.A. Frank Hogan, who qualitatively analyze cases. They're not swayed by what the media thinks. And they care about facts. They care about evidence. And that's what Adams talked about, those pesky little things called evidence. Part of the American value system, and, and certainly in 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 court, was framed around what Adams and Hamilton did. Adams, when he represented the, uh, those officers involved in the so-called Boston Massacre, for example, in 1770, in Haymarket Square, outside the Customs Court. We were taught in school that the British fired upon the uh, colonists, which they did, but it turned out that Adams represented those soldiers, the British soldiers, and he was subject to public scorn. Really? I did not know that. And he exonerated six of the eight. He represented, and the head, the head, the captain, he exonerated also because he was able to prove to the jury that the, the group of colonists, the mob, attacked the British soldiers, forcing them to fire. And that's what happened. So mm. that is, and then Hamilton, in his own right, brilliant lawyer, brilliant individual, but a brilliant lawyer who was arguing about judicial review in a case in 1784. I think it was Wadding, uh, Rutgers v. Waddington. Waddington was a uh, Tory who, uh, in 1776 or thereabouts, took over the British asked him to take over this brewery in downtown Manhattan. Uh, I think on Manana Lane, Duane Street, right there below Wall Street, 
And Rutgers was a woman who was a patriot, and she left, and her brewery was taken over by the British and was given to Washington. And after the war, New York State passed a statute, a, tr a trespass statute, for those who were, had taken the property of the colonists, now uh -huh. the young Americans. And, and Hamilton represented Waddington, the Tory, for two reasons. One, he didn't want Tories to be abused post-war. And two, he felt that the statute that was passed by New York was, he was arguing that it was illegal. It wasn't until Marbury v. Madison, uh, when Chief Justice Marshall wrote the opinion in, in, what is it, 1802, around in that period of time, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, that the Marbury v. Madison case was about judicial review. That's to say that the court, the Supreme Court, the courts, the federal courts, would be able to say and, and state that certain statutes that were passed were not constitutional, which made the judiciary the third member of our co-equal tripartite branch of government. After all, it, was, it now had the power to say to the Congress, the law you pass is unconstitutional. And uh, here was, in, in 1784, I believe, was, was Rutgers v. Washington, and in 1784 you had Hamilton basically arguing that point. Of course, there was no Constitution then, but that's the nature of who these founders truly were. They were selfless, and as they said, they, they placed their fortune, their lives, their reputation, all on the line for the revolution. So it, it is, JFK was right. We are heirs to that great revolution, and we should be proud of our ancient heritage. wasn't perfect, you know that, but without them, we wouldn't have this great country we have today, that's for sure. I feel like your story is so rich. You, you've you been through so many things. You've witnessed so many things, and, and you've achieved and accomplished so much. Um, I'm, I'm so curious. I feel like you've lived out a lot of different people's dreams. You know, you've, you went to college on a basketball scholarship, you ended up working in this dream job. Um, and now you're a very, very successful writer. Can you tell me a little bit about which, if any of those, I mean, was your like number one dream or how it feels to be, I almost don't want to ask like, oh, how does it feel to be so successful? Because I feel like that's very shallow. But I, I mean, what has this meant to you? I've been blessed. I've been very lucky. That's how I see it. I mean, you know the language of fame if you win it comes and goes in a minute. Where mm. are the real things in life to cling to? That's what. Uh, that's how I feel about life that I've led. I, I've been blessed. I've been with outstanding, brilliant people, many of whom who um, affected me were totally selfless and took the time to mentor me uh, and take the right path. So I was fortunate to learn from District Attorney Frank Hogan, from now Federal District Court Judge John Keenan, who is Assistant District Attorney, as I mentioned, in charge of the Homicide Bureau, my bureau chief, and of course, Assistant District Attorney Mel Glass, who became a Supreme Court Judge in his career. But they had a major influence upon me, as did my coaches playing ball. You mentioned the basketball thing, my high school coach, uh, I had a reunion for him here six years ago, and regrettably, uh, this past September, he just passed away. Uh, he had retired and moved down to Florida. He was an enormous influence about preparation, preparation, preparation. He was like a bank. You could only make deposits, and you couldn't uh, take any withdrawals. <laughs> couldn't say on Monday and Tuesday, hey, Coach, I don't want to play. Uh, I don't want to practice very hard. Take out some of those uh, deposits I made. No way. <laughs> and he was right. He was right about the lessons he taught, about taking pride in yourself, about teamwork, about being unselfish, about winning as a team, about praising others and not yourself. Same thing in college. And it all was sort of one whole to me. But it's a daily thing. I'm, I'm concerned about what is doing, not what happened yesterday, but what's going to happen today and tomorrow. So I, as I said, it's, it's, I'm very lucky. I, I'm probably the luckiest person, as Lou Gehrig said. Uh, as he said, he thought he was the luckiest person. That famous speech he gave on July 4th, I think it was 1939, in Yankee Stadium when he knew the end was near, and he said that he thought he was the luckiest person on the planet. I, sh I, I understand what he was talking about. What a great attitude to have about your success. I, I know a lot of people would say like, oh, you know, I'm just really great. I'm really talented. But thank you for saying that. I feel like that means a lot that you credit a lot of it to other people and to luck. I, I think that just, it makes for a very rich and promising story. So thank you well, for saying that. Well, thank you. That's something I firmly believe in. Yeah. I left out, for example, some of my law professors at Berkeley who were absolutely incredible, brilliant geniuses, 
and never once and uh, did they ever permit any political belief they may have had or any other belief other than what the law was and, and the reasonable way that you reach opinions and conclusions and what your job is as a lawyer that is to be a problem solver they never permitted ever to my knowledge their individual feelings uh let's say politically for example to influence anything they said and uh to this day i mean the district attorney of new york county frank hogan never knew if i was a democrat republican or otherwise <laughs> I, the same with his virtues that was never even something that mattered there was only one thing that mattered, the qualitative analysis of cases. What would be the right disposition? First of all, is the defendant guilty? If not, you get you dismiss that case. If you need further investigation, you continue to investigate. And if you have proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you charge. Then the question is, how do you dispose of these cases? You don't throw the book at a 17-year-old wheelman, for example, in a felony murder, who drives a, his friend who has a long criminal record to a liquor store. You don't give the driver a medal, but you don't <laughs> keep him in jail for the rest of his life particularly if he's going to testify and other things that happen, which show contrition and other aspects of how you administer the system. So those, those kinds of considerations are, are critical. I don't know how anyone who has any sense of success, however meager it may be or great, cannot be grateful to the people who touched them. You, you know that either there was a divine informa- uh, you know, either there's some divine intervention here, or you're just the luckiest guy in the world. That's all. That's- it. Either way, you know, I say, thank God, that was it. And of course, I left out the most important part of my entire life, which is my family, my wife, mm-hmm. my children. It's interesting, the left and right turns we take in life. Had I accepted my appointment to the Naval Academy, for example, or even chose Stanford, where I had a scholarship as well, and most other schools, I never would have met my wife, who I met when we were at Berkeley together. So I know that there's a divine intervention somewhere here, where at the last moment, I, when I was uh, offered a, a chance to go visit the school, and I hadn't visited any schools except for the Naval Academy, and I said I would. And when I went there, as I said, it was like summer camp, unbelievable. And, uh, and then I met my wife. So we've been married. This June will be 50 years. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. She's an angel. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, my gosh. I love this. There's a lot of people listening to this show who are new writers, aspiring writers, people who are maybe thinking about taking that step toward maybe writing their first book. Do you have any advice to give them? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm often asked to speak about this. And the the, the key is, as far as I'm concerned, is what is the story you want to tell? What is it that, this is what Henry Robbins said to me when I finally got a chance to speak and meet with him. (laughs) Uh, Way back when, when I was was telling him I wanted to do this book, Badge of the Assassin. And he said, why would anybody want to read it? And he says, I shouldn't even say that, because he thought that was a cruel thing to say. <laughs> oh, that's a fair comment. Why would anybody want to read it? And I'm going to tell you why. And I went through the, the issues that were involved in this, the investigation, the nature of dealing with different uh, uh, law enforcement agencies around the country. Killers came from San Francisco. Killers had a criminal record in San Francisco. After the murders in New York, they went back to San Francisco and tried to, and did kill police rob banks and try to sh- uh, murder another police officer who survived. And they, one of them went down and buried one of the uh, dead officer's guns that, that he took from him in New York and buried it in a farm in Mississippi. So in New Orleans played an, 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 uh, into this as well, where the, the, the lead killer was hiding out. So I said, the, the people care. They're going to care. And they want to know from the point of view of the prosecutor what's involved, not just from the defense, but from the prosecutor. What's going on in this world today? particularly in a world where you have a lot of scandals involving law enforcement and should people believe police or not, and, and yet as a prosecutor, you work hand in glove with the police. Without the police, they're like your offensive line if you're a quarterback in football. You can be the greatest quarterback in the, whoever played the game, but if you have no offensive line, you, you're never going to throw the ball. I say, what is the story you want to tell? What's the beginning, middle, and end? Who are the characters? How, is, how are you going to play that out with respect to the characters? What is, what is the... How do you define the integrity of your characters? I just recently was talking about this, and I was talking about Harper Lee uh, to kill a mockingbird. And what was the nature of the story? Some of the stories are so straightforward and simple. What, is, what was the driving force there that people who were different from us wind up being objects of scorn, of ridicule? Isn't that what this whole story in large measure is about? You have the Robinson character who is 
the defendant, uh, who is unjustly convicted, and it's a racist kind of situation. And then you have the bogeyman. You you have uh, Boo Bradley, Boo Radley rather, who winds up saving the children. Of course, that was Robert Duvall's, I think, one of his first movies he ever made. It's a straightforward story, is what I'm trying to suggest, in that the brilliance of the way the characters play it out, as she conceived it, have made it into a legendary tale. And that's something, you know, I, I believe most of us have at least one book in us, believe me. You've got to really be honest about it, uh, if you're willing to open up and what your observations are and how you see that interplaying amongst the characters and the tale you wish to tell. That is wonderful advice, and thank you for sharing that. I want to give listeners a chance to go out and purchase your books. Where can they do that? Well, certainly at Amazon, or at, uh, I would hope the mom-and-pop bookstores have it. Certainly um, the chains have it. Barnes & Noble have them. You know, you can get them uh, through Kindle. You can get them through um, openroadmedia.com. There are many ways to do it. You can go to Robert K. Tannenbaum Books. Dot com, for example. I'm sure that will lead people to um, the world of the purchase. It's out there. So, And if not, call up Simon & Schuster and tell them it should be out there. It'll <laughs> be a book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate anyway, that. I love talking about it because it's, uh, it's, it's such a pure, wonderful field to be in. The world of ideas. It is. I mean, that's another great aspect of uh, America, in my judgment. You know, I have to tell you, my, par- my grandparents came from Europe. So my parents were first-generation Americans. And my grandparents came here with absolutely nothing, just the clothes on their back. I always remark of their courage. And uh, when they got off that ship in New York, they just went to work. No one waiting for them. In many respects, they were like the Puritans. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the Puritans came and came to America, there was no uh, trading post. There was no motel. <laughs> There was a forest, and uh, they made it. So the reason I mention this is my my grandparents would always say, only in America, only in America. All the good things you're capable of doing, and they would always say, only in America. So the whole writing business is also an only in America story. Sure, you can do it anywhere else in large measure, but the kind of freedom we have, we have to cherish and preserve. And so many generations of Americans have sacrificed for it that we should pause and and reflect upon all the blood and treasure that has been spilled and spent so that we can be free. And isn't it wonderful you participate in writing books, for example, you participate in writing and talking about them. What a wonderful way to spend your time. It is. You can't see me right now, but I'm just, I'm I'm smiling and nodding. This is, yes, I I couldn't agree more. Well, I appreciate you giving me a chance to uh, go off and espouse my tales No, I love this. I love this. And honestly, you know, I could really just talk to you for hours. Thank you for for your views and your thoughts tonight. I've had a really not great week. And just talking to you tonight has just changed my attitude. So thank you so much for um, for sharing your story and for your service to the country and all of these wonderful things you've done. Well, Sarah, thank you for what you do. Getting the word out for people to have a chance to break into this world is, is just a, a fabulous attribute and opportunity to be in, in, in some respect being a gatekeeper and, and opening that gate to people who want to pass through. God bless you. That's all I have to say. Oh, thank you. My gosh, Robert, this, is, this has been so, so wonderful. Thank you again for everything. I cannot wait to go out and get your latest book. I cannot wait for your latest, latest book to come out. Um, and you said September 2017? 20, yes, September, the pub date. We don't have a firm date yet in September, but it'll be in September 2015. As a matter of fact, I just submitted my tease chapter in, um, for Infamy. Infamy came out in hardcover from Simon & Schuster mm. uh, in September. And, and in March, the uh, mass market paperback will be out, and I just submitted the prologue and first uh, chapter for my book that, I'm, that will come out in September uh, without fear or favor. So when you get the paperback, if you want to, in March of Infamy, you'll see the prologue in Chapter 1 as a tease in the back of the book. Awesome. I can't wait. Uh, Listeners, thank you so much for being with us today. Go out and buy Robert's books. You're going to be so happy you did. So, Robert, thank you again for being on the show. Please don't hesitate to keep in touch. Thank you again. 
Sarah, anytime. God bless you. You and too. Happy New Year. Oh, you too. Have a great evening and keep doing what you're doing.